We sometimes hear some people talking about law as a science. In this video, we're going to discuss whether law does really lend itself to classification as a science, whether it is really a discipline that can be studied in a systematic way, whether it does really have the attributes of a science like we would expect uh, for all other disciplines that uh, lend themselves to classification as sciences. By the end of uh, this video, you should be able to do the following. You should define the term law, differentiate the divisions of, and subdivisions of law, what are sometimes known as fields of law. You should be able to describe patrimonial law, define the term right, and give categories of rights. You must also be able to describe legal subjects, what is a legal subject, then distinguish between categories of legal subjects or legal persons, and be able to uh, define concepts such as a delict, name and you know describe the grounds of the justification in respect of delicts, as well as uh, take an overview of uh, such concepts, uh, such branches of law as undue enrichment. To begin with, we would like to ask, answer this simple question, and the question is, what is law? Uh, and what are those relationships or those aspects of life which can be classified as a, being part of the law, or as forming part of the issues that can be dealt with in terms of the law. A father takes his daughter for a walk every afternoon, as seen in our picture here. Does he break the law when he fails to do so at a certain day? Does the law attach any consequences to this kind of uh, you know, action by the father? Uh, what about a scenario where the father refuses to pay school fees for the daughter, leading to the daughter being excluded from school. So when we ask ourselves the question, what is law, we are looking at uh, legally relevant actions or legally relevant relationships between persons to which the law attaches consequences. But as we go down in our video, we will look at a detailed def a definition of what the law actually is. One way of looking at the law is to say that it is a set of norms of conduct or rules of human behavior that are binding to the community and should be obeyed by all members of the society. And there are different types of norms that are binding to the community because some are binding to certain individuals and others are binding to the whole community. And we've said that the legal norms are those that are binding to the whole community. Now, let's look at some of uh, the norms that uh, we have in, in society. We have legal norms, we have mentioned those. Then we have moral and religious norms. We also have other forms of norms. Now. Uh, strictly speaking, a legal norm binds the whole community which enforces it through community-based sanctions and instruments. But religious norms are only binding to the members of the religious group. Sometimes we have a moral norm which only binds the person involved in its application. For instance, when we say that uh, uh, religious norms are only binding to the members of the religious group, we are saying that uh, the religious group itself determines what norms they are, as well as uh, determining when these norms have been broken, as well as the appropriate action to be taken uh, in respect of those who have broken those specific norms. So the difference now between a legal norm and a religious norm is that a legal norm 
is binding across society, broadly speaking, whilst a, a religious norm is only applicable to the members of a particular religious persuasion who then determine what sanction or yes, remedy must be taken when such a norm has been violated. The norm, moral norms, on the other hand, are binding only to the specific persons who are involved in them. For instance, a person who believes that uh, it is morally wrong to steal, uh, when they have stolen, after committing that act, they feel very convicted inside of them, and uh, they, they, you know, they feel all the, 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 the pressures of having done something. So, so the moral sanction comes to them. They are the ones who feel, you know, the moral sanction, the guilt associated with carrying out such an act. Besides the government, which other uh, institutions are competent to set norms? Uh, we have religious groupings, certainly, and we have individuals, we have spoken about that. Looking at uh, the picture we have here, does the institution represented in this image have the competence to set and to dispense norms? And which types of norms does it dispense? Are they legal? Are they social? Or they are religious? Uh, this building seems like a religious building, a building where people gather for the purposes of worship. And certainly this kind of an institution does not dispense legal norms, but it, it dispenses uh, religious norms. We have already indicated above that law is the set of norms that are binding to the whole community. Now, our next step is to look at uh, branches or divisions of law. Uh, law is actually classifiable in various uh, divisions and branches. We have public law and we also have got private law. Now, by public law, we mean the law that's concerned with the relationships between the state and the individual. And uh, examples of, uh, you know, the branches that fall within this broad class, uh, we have constitutional law, we have criminal law, we have administrative law. We also have formal or procedural law, that is subject such as the law of procedure as well as the law of evidence. By procedure, we mean criminal procedure as well as civil procedure. Then we have international law also falling under the broad class called public law. Whilst uh, private law is concerned with the relationship between the individuals and, under the, and other individuals, for instance, the law of persons, the law of personality, family law, the law of contract, as well as the law of patrimony. So these are the broad classes of law, as, as, as we would say. But we have got another, we've got another class of law where we, we can't call it another as such because it constitutes, as, uh, constitutes many other subdivisions. So we would rather call it other areas of law. Uh, laws such as uh, mercantile law, labor law, the conflict of laws, as well as legal philosophy. Now, these do not uh, fall neatly into the divisions, whether public law or, or private law. So we are better off just saying uh, other areas of law to encompass these. Let's take a look at... Uh, the branches or the fields or the divisions of laws. This is just a schematic summary of what we dealt with above. Where we have law, then we have there's uh, branches, namely we have our public law, then we have our private law, as two broad branches, then we have our other. If this is the other that we spoke about where we said we have mercantile law, 
we have labor law, we have conflict of law, and we have legal philosophy or jurisprudence. At some point we will check uh, a broad discussion on the elements of private law because it's a very essential part of uh, you know, the private law course. Uh, the main branches then uh, in connection with uh, you know, elements of private law, we have the law of persons, the law of uh, personality, the law of patrimony and the family law. Now when it comes to uh, private law, uh, particularly the area of the law of patrimony, which is quite broad. We have the law of things or the law of property. Then we have the law of su succession as well as the law of obligations, which also breaks into more branches where we are dealing with uh, the law of contract, the law of delict, as well as the law of undue enrichment. Those are the key areas in the area of uh, the private law. Thinking about mercantile law, we'd like to ask ourselves a few questions which are very critical to our understanding of what it is. What is mercantile law? We should also be able to identify the activities that fall within this branch of the law, list some of the customs that have developed in respect of conducting the business, for instance, if a seller de delivers defective goods, does the customer have any remedies against the seller? These are critical aspects of, the, of mercantile law, uh, particularly the issue of contract. Take a look at uh, the picture. What does it deal with? What does it display? Uh, do we see any signs of uh, interaction based on uh, mercantile law as we have alluded to in the foregoing uh, presentation. Let's take a summary of uh, mercantile law. It constitutes those legal rules dealing with the customs of merchants and relating to business activity. Uh, examples of, of, of you know aspects that of, of, rather examples of the aspects of uh, mercantile law uh, include the contracts of sale, lease, credit agreements, negotiable instruments, the law of insolvency, company law, partnerships, closed corporations, the law of agency, the law of security, of security insurance contracts contracts of transportation, labor law, intellectual property law, competition law, and consumer law, as well as tax law. So these are, you know, the aspects that one looks at when they are dealing with the mercantile, mercantile law. In all this, one of the questions you may want to ask yourself is, what role do these divisions of law play in real life? We've spent time talking about the divisions, but why is it necessary to even talk about the divisions? Well, we need to understand that legal relationships, disputes and questions fall into several branches of law. So in the process of solving a legal matter, it is critical and important to always try to situate the issues of the facts within the specific fields of the law within which the main questions fall. In other words, before you can begin to solve a question, you must understand what principles or what concepts you need to, to, to take into account. So classifying a case or classifying a dispute within the broad branches then helps you to easily find the concepts that are relevant to that uh, legal question or dispute that you are dealing with. Uh, please take note that these branches do not represent niche compartments cast in stone. They are very, very flexible. They are mere conceptual categories which assist in the search for suitable solutions in legal disputes. So do not assume that they are cast in stone. They are not. Whenever you are dealing with uh, 
issues of private law. There are essential uh, concepts to do with commercial law that you will have to master and take into account. We have concepts such as legal rights, legal subjects. What is a legal right? What is a legal subject? Um, law of persons, of course, we did allude to at some point. We have natural persons, we have juristic persons, we have legal objects is, you know, subjective uh, rights. You must always take note of these concepts because they are very essential in our understanding of uh, private law concepts, particularly those to do with commercial law. What is a right? It is a legally protected entitlement which a legal subject has in respect of a specific legal object. For instance, ownership. When I say I own this computer, I have a legally protected entitlement in respect of the legal object. So it is a legally protected right, a rather a legally protected uh, right is called a subjective right. Well, we have different kinds of rights uh, in our image there. We have a bill of rights. Uh, our identities have been stolen. Uh, Somebody is making a joke there. A sign that uh, rights are legally protectable. And when they are stolen, one is entitled to some remedies. A legal subject is a bearer of legal rights. And the law recognizes two categories of, of, of subjects with natural uh, subjects as well as juristic persons as bearers of uh, legal rights. And when you look at our image there, we have a natural person as well as a juristic person in the form of a company. So those are the broad classifications. Take note that legal subjects are bearers of rights and law. The law applies to them and it exists for them. There are certain fundamental features of natural as well as juristic persons which enhance their competence to become bearers of rights. But the most important thing is that the law applies to them and the law exists for them. When it comes to subjective rights, we have uh, quite a number of categories which include the real rights, intellectual property rights, personality rights, as well as personal rights. We need to elaborate on those, but briefly, real rights are rights that one has in respect of an object, uh, such as maybe property, so uh, an example of a real right would be ownership. Uh, even such rights as possession could be, they are examples of, of, of real right. Then intellectual property rights, take an example of uh, somebody who writes a book or composes a song. They own the rights in respect of uh, the, cre the, the creative work of art. Then personality rights that would exist, for instance, in terms of uh, uh, when somebody maybe causes an injury to you, uh, it is your personality right, uh, personality right, which is the right to bodily integrity, that is infringed by that injury. Then personal rights are rights which exist uh, or accrue to an individual, maybe on the basis of some work that they have done. They could arise in terms of a contract or in terms of a an injury arising through intellectual action. So those four broad classes are very essential for our uh, understanding of subjective rights. Now, our next question is, what is a legal object? It is an entity capable of being a legal uh, subject's claim to a right. Uh, for instance, look at that car very beautiful car, and look at that building there. Those are examples of objects that are capable of being subject to a claim 
by a legal subject. So in other words, a legal subject can claim real rights or any rights, a personal rights in respect of uh, those objects. So we are saying that's what a legal object is. Uh, the examples being property, intellectual property, aspects of personality, as well as the right to performance. So all those are legal objects since human beings are capable of being bearers of rights in respect of them. We have here an elaboration of uh, the categories of the subjective uh, right. We said the right is the relationship between a legal uh, subject and a legal object, as well as the relationship between a legal subject and other legal subjects in respect of an object. For instance, I gave the example of my computer from which I'm making this uh, video. Uh, I have a, a relationship with this computer. I have ownership, a right of ownership over the computer. And then you, as a listener of this, obviously is not, you are not the owner of this computer, which means there are certain obligations that arise in connection uh, with this computer, that is connecting you. You cannot claim ownership, you are not the owner. So, hence we are saying, is the relationship between a legal subject and the legal object, and the relationship between the legal subject and other legal subjects in respect of the object. And then a real right uh, is a right which, is the, which a legal subject has over an object such as the computer or cell phone. Examples of real rights, uh, we have uh, ownership, which is the most comprehensive real right, and then we have servitude, which is a limited uh, right over the property of another legal subject. Uh, examples of servitudes being prior servitudes as well as personal servitudes. And then we have uh, uh, security by way of maybe property, where we have a mortgage and a pledge. Uh, these confer security rights in favor of a creditor in respect of the property of a debtor. That's very important for us to take note of. So the other subjective rights include intellectual property, personality rights, as well as personal rights. Whereby by intellectual property rights we mean uh, entitlements that one has uh, of a uh, objects of one's creative mind, for instance, the works of your hand or the works of your mind, which include an invention, if you invent a new machine, or music, a musical composition, or a drawing, if you draw some work of art. So that's your intellectual property, which you are entitled to, and you must be protected, and that right you must be protected. And then we also have personality rights, such as uh, rights in respect of personality, a good name, a reputation, or physical integrity, that is being protected from physical harm, and uh, being used as a, a subject of experimentation. And then we also have uh, personal rights, that is uh, entitlements, which arise from maybe in respect of a performance or action that can be demanded. For instance, a creditor is required to act or desist from acting in a particular way. An employee uh, is expected uh, to provide labor to his employer, to his or her employer. And on the other hand, the employer is obliged, that is obligated, to give a salary to an employee who has conducted or carried out work on their behalf. We have come to the end of our discussion on the science of law. Remember, we began by asking ourselves whether the law could be studied systematically whether it uh, presented any structure or any conceptual categories which would uh, lend it to easy classification as a discipline and as a science. Um, in this video, we defined the concept of law 
we noted different divisions and subdivisions of law. We defined rights and we gave categories of rights as well as, and we also described a legal, a legal subject while dis distinguishing between legal categories, two legal uh, categories of legal subjects and persons, speaking about natural as well as juristic persons. We discussed legal rights in general, uh, elaborating in, on each one of the subjective uh, rights. We have an upcoming video which is going to be dealing with the description of patrimonial law, the def definition of the concept of delete as well as uh, the grounds of justification for a delict, of course. And we are also going to be looking at uh, issues such as unjustified enrichment. Thank you very much for taking your time to watch this video. Uh, looking forward to meeting you again in the next one. In the meantime, have a great time.